everyone, welcome to Truth 2021. I welcome you on behalf of myself and Victor, the Virtual International Consortium for Truth Research. If you don't know about it already, Victor is an online community of scholars interested in philosophical issues concerning the value and the nature of truth. We welcome anyone who is interested in those issues. Our mission is to give researchers a platform for sharing their work with a virtual community of colleagues independent of geographical location and institutional affiliation, foster an environment of critical constructive feedback, promote gender, racial, and ethnic inclusivity among those doing work on truth. We support research in all areas of the philosophy of truth, including but not limited to work on the nature of truth, the value of truth, elithic virtues and vices, among others, and the importance of truth to issues in social, political, and moral philosophy. Virtue exists, uh, Victor exists because of the generous support provided by the Future of Truth project at the University of Connecticut, with additional support from the University of Waikato and the University of Alabama. In addition to this conference, Victor organizes online events throughout the year. We have mailing list, a mailing list, you can join a website, we have a Facebook group you can join, and we are on Twitter and YouTube where you can find videos of past events. In today's session, we have a discussion of Maria Bagramian and Annalisa Koliva's recent book, Relativism, published by Routledge. Unfortunately, given family circumstances, Maria Bagramian is not here physically. Uh, here is our plan for the session. We'll start out with the comments. We'll start with Max Koebel. We will have a five minute break and then we'll have comments from Eduardo uh, Perez Navarro, another five minute transition break, then comments from Paul Bogosian, another five minute transition break, and then comments from John McFarlane. After that, we'll have a, about a 10 minute break and then we'll be back uh, for responses from Professor Ramian and uh, Professor Koliva, and then we'll have a QA about, say, 45 minutes. We will be recording the talks, um, but not the Q&A to post on YouTube later. We will later also leave the Zoom session going if you're interested in continuing discussing informally and we can also create breakout rooms for you. Please join me in wel welcoming uh, Max Köbel. I would like to say a couple of words about Max Köbel. Uh, Max Koebel has been teaching and researching at the Institute for Philosophy at the University of Vienna since September 2019. There he leads the research area analytical philosophy with special consideration of the philosophy of language. His main interests are in the area of philosophy of language, epistemology, metaphysics, and metaethics. He is currently in the process of initiating new research activities in the field of philosophy of language. He's one of nine participants in the FWF Doc Founds project Forms of Normativity. He has made various contributions to relativism, including his paper, Faultless Disagreement, and his book, Truth Without Objectivity. We are very happy to have Max. Welcome, Max. I'm gonna stop sharing my slide. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much to the Victor network for organizing this, especially to Susanna and Drew, who seem to have the responsibility for this session in particular. Um, so in their book, Relativism, Maria and Annalisa offer a panoramic view of various forms of relativism and their history. They make considerable effort to engage sympathetically with relativists and to portray the motivations and advantages of the various forms of relativism they discuss. They bravely opt for an approach that attempts to articulate a common core in many views that have been thought of as forms of relativism. And this enables them to approach their subject matter in a systematic, unifying way. This is surely a good feature of the book. However, ultimately, Maria and Annalisa conclude that, I quote, no model can provide a coherent account all core claims and motivations of relativism, unquote. And they voiced the suspicion that relativism may be an, quote, incoherent concept, unquote. 
The fact that this is the conclusion, of course, raises the question whether Maria and Amelisa's core claims and motivations fit the claims and motivations of actual relativists, and whether relativism the term relativism is adequately characterized by Maria and Annalisa's core claims and motivations. I shall here not discuss the question of how the term relativism is best defined, but since I'm one of the philosophers who figure as the target relativists in the book, I shall engage with the objections that are put forward against various substantive views of mine. So here comes the first section abandoning a long established view. One point of substantial disagreement between myself, myself and Maria and Annalisa comes out in the following remark about truth relativists amongst which they count me. One important weakness, this is the quote, one important weakness of their view is that they reject the long established view of propositional content that Kaplan and Hawthorne have called the simple view according to which propositions bear truth and falsity as monadic properties. So it's true that I and many others have proposed operating with propositional contents that do not have absolute truth values. I shall shortly provide a sketch of such a view and what it can do. But before that, it's worth clarifying two points. First, the view I challenge is not particularly long established or even established. When Frege introduced the technical term thought for the theoretical entities that were to play the role of the content of judgments and assertions, he stipulated that they were to have absolute truth values. But before Frege and after Frege, there are important theorists who operate with propositional contents that do not conform to Frege's constraint. So and here in the written paper, I have a, a kind of lengthy list of people including in particular the Stoics, uh, people who invented formal semantics in the 60s and 70s, um, like Lewis and Kaplan, but also people in the De Say literature like Perry, um, uh, as well as Robert Stolmaker, Alan Gibbert, Elizabeth Coppock. Um, and the point of the long list, which I'm not gonna um, read out here, um, is to demonstrate that it's not an established view that propositional contents are absolutely truth evaluable. One might argue that there was maybe a brief period in the 90s or early 2000s when Frege's constraint on propositional content was treated as established orthodoxy amongst philosophers. But even if so, then it's no longer the established view. So the second thing I wanted to remark about about this uh, quote that I gave you is, um, uh, so what's the second point? The, the, the second point is that um, it's sensible to distinguish the ordinary monadic truth predicate and the corresponding concept from the truth predicate in formal semantics and the corresponding concept. The latter, i.e. the formal semantics uh, predicate and concept, is clearly not monadic, not by anyone's lights, I think, while the former, the ordinary truth predicate and concept is. Um, so it's important to mention this in order to avoid the false impression that truth relativism involves the view that the ordinary truth predicate is not monadic. Rather, it is a view about which theoretical entities are most suitable to play the role of propositional content in the theory of propositional attitudes and or in a theory of linguistic content. Let me, so this was the first section. Let me check whether this is working, whether people can hear me properly. Everything okay? I see some nodding, okay. And it has the script actually gotten around, gotten out to people. Okay, excellent. So let's move on to the second section, which is called the simple theory. So for concreteness, let me provide a brief sketch of a very simple theory that operates with propositional contents that are not absolutely truth or valuable, and which corresponds to the theory that Maria and Annalisa criticize under the heading truth relativism. For the record, 
I regard propositions as theoretical entities we use to model certain representational aspects of thought and or language. As with all models, one model that does a good job for one purpose does not preclude another model also doing a good job for the same or another purpose. I do not assume that if this account is useful, no other account can be useful. The theory, so the simple theory that I mentioned uses a kind of centered proposition as propositional content. Each proposition will determine a function from centered worlds to truth values. A centered world is a pair of a possible world and the center. And the center in turn is a pair of the thinker and the time. I'm saying determines and not is identical to because I want to leave open whether these center propositions are unstructured intentions, in which case I would have had to say identical, or structured entities, in which case I would have had to say merely determines. Thus, for each such centered content, there's a unique characteristic set of centered worlds, the set containing the centered worlds at which it receives the truth value true. For simplicity, I shall take. I shall talk as if the centered contents just are these sets of centered worlds, i.e. that they are unstructured. But all I'm going to argue could be equally argued for a structured version of centered contents. So let's say that it is correct for a thinker S to believe such a centered content at a time T and world W, if the set it determines contains the centered world WST with, and if we want to build it in the simplification now that we are talking just about unstructured sets of centered worlds, and this makes for the following correctness principle. For all thinkers S times T and worlds W, if it is correct for S to believe a centered content C at a time T and world W, if and only if C contains the centered world WST. So for concreteness, let me discuss a few examples. To begin with, consider the set C1 of centered worlds, WST, such that in W, there is an epidemic in Vienna in 2020. So the condition for being in this set is just um, that it's a centered world, which has um, a world as its component where there's an epidemic in Vienna in 2020. And there's no condition on the um, on the thinker and the time, i.e. there's no condition on the center. So whether it's correct to believe this set depends only on the world the belief takes place in, not on who believes it or when they believe it. Thus, some centered contents meet something like the Fregain constraint. Since only one world is actual, they have an absolute, absolute truth value in some sense. Such centered contents have been called boring or portable in the Dese literature. So when I believe that there is an epidemic in Vienna in 2020, our simple theory models that belief as having such a centered content C1. Similarly, if I say there is an epidemic in Vienna in 2020, our simple theory models the utterance as an assertion of that content. So now consider a different set, the set C2 of centered worlds, WST, such that in W, Jaffa cakes tend to cause gustatory pleasure in S at T under normal conditions. So I've written it out as a kind of definition of that set C2 as well for your convenience. So if a thinker at a time actually tends to get gustatory pleasure from Jaffa cakes under normal conditions, then it is correct for that thinker to believe C2. And this is a consequence of the correctness principle C that we introduced above. This is now a centered content that violates Frege's constraint. It's not boring, so it's non-boring and non-portable. Our simple theory models, for example, Clara's belief or judgment that Jaffa cakes are tasty as C2, or as having C2 as a content. Similarly, if Clara says Jaffa cakes are tasty, then the simple theory models the utterance as an assertion of C2. This makes room for a situation of faultless disagreement, namely when Clara believes C2, 
And Mimi believes the negation, i.e. the complement set, non-C2, that is, if Mimi believes that Jaffa cakes are not tasty, in a situation where Clara tends to get gustatory pleasure from Jaffa cakes and Mimi does not, these beliefs would be correct, would both be correct, according to the principle, the correctness principle, even though the contents believed are contradictory in, in the sense that there is no centered world at which both are true. Now consider the set C3 of centered contents, WST. This is a different example now. Such that in W at T, S is subject to a system of moral norms that prohibits reading one's children's mail without their permission. I've written that out um, as an equation also, if you want to get back to it. When Anna believes that it's morally wrong to read one's children's mail without their permission, the simple theory says that C3 is what she believes. It's the object of her belief. When Anna says it's morally wrong to read one's children's mail without their permission, then according to the simple theory, Anna asserts that content, C3. If Eugene believes non-C3, the complement set, uh, if he believes that it's not morally wrong to read one's children's mail without their permission, then both Eugene and Anna might believe correctly, even though they believe contradictory contents. Also, the simple theory predicts. All this requires is that Anna's system of norms prohibit and Eugene's system permit reading one's children's mail without their permission. Now consider the set C4 of centered world's WST such that in W at T, S has evidence that makes it likely that Atlas III will win the race. So Atlas III is a racehorse. In the simple theory, C4 models the content of a punter's belief that it is probable that Atlas III will win the race. It also treats that centered content as what the punter asserts when he says, it is probable that Atlas III will win the race. If our punter has the required evidence at one time, he is correct in believing C2 at that, C4 at that time, according to the correctness principle. But when he acquires new undermining evidence, for example, knowledge of an injury, believing C4 may no longer be correct for him. His earlier belief and his later belief of the negation, non-C4, can both be correct beliefs. The punter can be quite happy with his early, earlier probability assignment, given that it was correct. He could say that he was correct in believing C4 earlier, but that he is now, that he now correctly rejects C4. Finally, consider the set C5 of centered worlds, WST, such that in W at T, the evidence available to S is compatible with the solution in a game of mastermind, S is playing at T, containing a green piece. I hope you're all familiar with that game. Otherwise, it's a bit opaque, this example. So the simple theory says that when Mary believes the solution might contain a green one, what she believes is C5. Similarly, what she asserts when she says the solution in this game of mastermind might contain a green piece is that content C5. Now, Mary might be playing with Anjan, who has set up the solution for her. If there is no green piece in the solution, Anjan knows it. So, if, so it is correct, sorry, so it is incorrect for Anjan to believe C5. He, in fact, believes non-C5. But Anjan knows exactly what evidence Mary has. Well, this is how the game works. One person sets up the solution and gives carefully regulated clues about it whenever the other person submits a guess. So Anjan himself rejects C5, but he also knows that Mary is correct in believing C5. The simple theory is in all relevant respects like the truth relativist theories Maria and Annalisa criticize in their book. Of course, this theory could be refined and improved, it could be restricted or extended. But for the moment, the simple theory will do the job of illustrating my answers to Maria and Annalisa's objections. Which takes us to the third section um, that treats the objections. 
Is everything running okay so far? Okay. So let's start with the first objection. Maria and Annalisa claim that my account cannot capture the sense of disagreement that we have in purported cases of faultless disagreement. They do so by making reference to the notion of basic disagreement, which they define as follows. A basic notion of disagreement, and this is a quote from the book, a basic notion of disagreement can be fleshed out by means of the following conditions. First, the incompatibility condition. A and B accept incompatible contents, such as P and not P. Second, the aboutness condition. The acceptance of these contents concerns the same circumstances. Given Kerbal's semantics, A and B can be said to hold incompatible contents, but crucially, they seem to violate the aboutness condition or the acceptance of these contents concerns different circumstances, that is, their respective gustatory standards. My response to the suggestion is the following. Let's return to the Clara and Mimi example. It seems to me that when Clara believes that Jaffa cakes are tasty and Mimi believes that they are not, they are disagreeing. The disagreement is about whether Jaffa cakes are tasty, not about anyone's gustatory responses. This is all perfectly captured by the simple theory. Now, Maria and Annalisa claim that a basic disagreement obtains only if the contents in question, I quote, concern the same circumstances, unquote. Now, I don't think when I and many other people say that Clara and Mimi disagree because one believes that Jaffa cakes are tasty and the other believes that they are not. This entails that their beliefs must concern the same circumstances. Well, this would make the simple idea of disagreement a highly technical affair only fully understood by those conversant with Kaplanian semantics. However, for the sake of argument, I can concede that Clara and Mimi do not have a basic disagreement in Maria and Annalisa's technical sense. In fact, no reference to disagreement is needed to generate the motivation for the simple theory. It can be motivated by the simple observation that Clara seems to believe something and Mimi seems to reject what Clara believes. There seems to be a P such that Clara believes that P and Mimi believes that not P. Nevertheless, none of them is committing any mistake. Their beliefs are correct, the simple theory can accept that things are as they seem. The second objection. The second objection claims that my theory makes false predictions about when disagreeing thinkers will enter into disputes. I quote, Max's theory predicts that they will normally engage in certain disagreement when the matter is objective, if the question is relevant, of course, because, because their underlying intuition is that someone is getting the facts wrong and the truth of the matter has to be unearthed. On the other hand, it predicts that speakers will normally not enter into any dispute when a disagreement arises on non-objective matters because their thought will be that disagreement is not yet a sign that anyone is getting things wrong. But, continues, this claim is disputable, both when the targeted area of discourse involves expressions of taste and when it concerns morality. After all, people do engage in disputes about taste and even more so about morality and do not just pass over opposite views in silence or even condone them." End of quote. My response, I agree with the claim that we do engage in disputes about taste and about morality. However, I reject the claims about what my theory predicts. Basically, it is not that easy to predict under what conditions people will engage in disputes. Let's think about two examples. Suppose Shepherd Jeff believes and says that there are 30 sheep in the pen and Shepherd Susan, his colleague, believes there are not because she has counted only 28. Then it may be quite important to establish whether Jeff is right. So it's relevant in the sense mentioned in the definition. Perhaps they have 30 sheeps and not all of them are there. 
So if not all of them are there, they urgently need to find the missing one before dark. It does seem to make sense for Susan to engage in dispute, to deny that Jeff has what Jeff has asserted, thereby preventing his assertion from updating the conversational score in the normal way. Then Jeff might answer back and say that he has just counted them twice to justify his assertion. Or he might respond that actually he hasn't counted them very carefully and propose a new count. But even in this sort of situation, the participants might choose not to engage in dispute. Susan might judge that even Jeff's stubbornness arguing about it doesn't help. Silently recount and go on a sheep search herself if necessary without any dispute. Or Susan might think that Jeff is much more reliable than she is and, uh, and thus simply change her mind and respond, again, without dispute. However, one thing is very unlikely to happen. Susan is not going to think that maybe Jeff's judgment is completely correct and her own judgment is also correct. She's not going to think that possibly no one has made a mistake. This is different in the case of Clara's and Mimi's disagreement about, about Jaffa case and whether they're tasty. It is a possibility that Clara is right to believe that Jaffa cakes are tasty and that Mimi is right to believe that they are not. Of course, they could still engage in dispute for all sorts of reasons. Clara might think that Mimi is mistaken, i.e. that Jaffa cakes in fact do tend to cause gustatory pleasure in Mimi. So she might argue they are tasty because they have chocolate on top and are really soft. You should have some. Perhaps Clara believes that Mimi likes chocolate and soft cakes. But Mimi might then answer back, yes, but the jelly is revolting. That would be a kind of serious discussion on a matter of taste, even though it's discussion amongst children. This is not ruled out by the simple theory. So the sympathy doesn't predict there will not be any kind of dispute. But they could even engage in dispute if they know that each of them is correct in their respective judgment. It might just be fun to debate this, to challenge the coherence of the other's taste judgments or whatever. Or there might be a social component involved. Clara might say, only sissies don't like the jelly. Mimi might retort, no, the jelly tastes like pee. There might be social pressure on having gustatory responses that are in line with the groups. This phenomenon exists not only among children. For example, acquiring a taste for real ale was a social gate opener when I lived in Birmingham, UK. In fact, a lot could be said about all the different purposes for which we engage in conversation and in disputes. However, there remains the important contrast that I have mentioned in Shepard, Jeff's and Susan's disagreement. Both know that at most one of them can be right. In Clara's and Mimi's dispute, they both know that both being right is a possibility. This difference between the two kinds of disagreement will be one, will be one of the factors that has to be taken into account when trying to predict whether the participants will or will not engage in a dispute. A recognition of this difference is what motivates the saying, de gustibus non est disputando. Of course, a hardboiled objectivist about taste might deny that there's a possibility that neither Clara or Mimi is wrong. Then this objectivist lacks one motivation for that part of the simple theory. We could then move on to some of the other cases. There's also a question about whether the account of tastiness as a judge-dependent property is an empirically correct theory about the concept of tastiness people in a given group have in their repertoires, or about the meaning of the term tasty in a particular group. I'm quite happy to concede that the simple theory is in this way open to empirical challenge. But I'm not happy to concede that the simple theory predicts that people would never engage in dispute on a discretionary matter, or that they would always engage in dispute when the matter is non-discretionary. The third objection. The next objection connects nicely to the previous one. I said that Shepard, Jeff, and Susan know that at least one of them must be wrong and that Clara and Mimi know that there is a possibility that each of them is correct in believing what they do. But how do they know this? 
In my 2002 book, I suggested that this knowledge is part of our linguistic competence and therefore a priori knowledge. Maria and Annalisa's third objection is against this view. I quote, equally problematic is Kozel's idea that in becoming competent communicators, we learn to tell when it is sensible to engage in some dispute because at least one of the parties must be in error and when it is not because neither party is at fault. This would entail that we should know at least implicitly and independently of any theoretical reflection just based on our linguistic competence, which areas of discourse are relativist and which are not. Thousands of years of discussion about these issues seem to prove otherwise. My response, the objection mixes up the question of whether we will engage in dispute with the question of whether we have knowledge on the basis of our competence, of whether there's a possibility of hopeless disagreement. I have already said that people's knowledge of whether a given disagreement could be faultless does not by itself allow any prediction as to whether they will engage in dispute. That was the last objection. It will be only one factor amongst many in generating such a prediction. However, I do recognize the central point, point made here, namely that it seems overly simplified to say that we have at least implicit knowledge of which areas of discourse are discretionary and which are not, and that we have this knowledge independently of any theoretical reflection. I agree that it can't be that simple. I do stick by my claim that Shepherds Jeff and Susan, as well as children Clara and Mimi, can recognize the status of their respective disagreements without any further reflection. However, there are many other areas where this is not so clear. For example, whether people can disagree faultlessly about what is probable as it is as controversial and difficult to decide as theories on the foundations of probability are. Thinking that disagreeing faultlessly about probability is possible is clearly the result of some theoretical considerations and foundations of probability. On the other hand, it seems much more plausible to me that competence involves this ability in the case of epistemic modes. Competence with epistemic might does seem to require that one recognize that what one can correctly believe about what might be the case depends on the changing evidence one has. So I agree with the criticism against this perhaps oversimplified aspect of the account in my 2002 book. The fourth, the fourth objection. The fourth and final objection, by not drawing a sharp distinction between the context of use and the context of assessment, he, i.e. me, does not seem to have the resources to explain the possibility of retraction. The latter consists in the practice of taking back what one said previously upon realizing later that what one said was false or inaccurate. Retraction is an important feature of our assertoric practice, and yet Kogel does not seem to have the resources to explain it. For if the context of use calls the shots, we were right when we judged, for instance, that licorice is tasty. We may have changed our minds and think differently now. Yet we cannot say that we were wrong back then, as the relevant standards remain for Kobel, those operative at the context of utterance. My response? I accept that retraction is an important feature of our asteroid practice, but I reject the claim that my account does not have the resources to explain it. In fact, I find it hard to understand the reasoning in the quote. Obviously, on the simple theory, there can be a difference between what we can correctly believe now and what we could correctly believe earlier. In such cases, we can take back something asserted earlier, but still maintain that the earlier assertion was correct. Let's look at this in an example. When the punter receives additional undermining evidence, he retracts his earlier assertion that Atlas III will probably win. You can say, for example, I take back what I said. It's not probable that Atlas III will win. In this case, he has retracted by asserting the negation of what he has asserted before. 
but he could also retract by merely taking it back without thereby committing himself to the negation of C4. I take back what I said. I'm not sure whether it's probable that F is the third will win. There's a special aspect of retraction when non-boring centered contents are concerned, i.e. matters on which Fox's disagreement is possible. When taking back the earlier assertion, the punter can also coherently maintain that the assertion he is taking back was at the time flawless. He was right to believe C4, i.e. that Atlas the third will probably win. But he can still take it back now because with the new evidence he has acquired, it is no longer correct for him to believe C4. There could be a different situation where the punter recognizes retrospectively that he made a mistake in assessing the evidence he had when he made the original assertion. This would also be a reason for retraction, but in this case, he would also maintain that the original assertion of the belief it gave voice to were incorrect. When we take back assertions on non-discretionary matters, and we know they are non-discretionary, only the second type of retraction is possible. Taking back the assertion and at the same time maintaining that the original assertion and the belief behind it were already wrong. I believe that this is all we need, all we need by way of an account of retraction. McFarlane in his 2014 book argues that introducing context of assessment in addition to context of utterance is required for doing justice to retraction phenomena. I've argued against this in my review of his book. So I'm not gonna get into that here. And that brings me to the end of the comments. So thank you very much for listening up to here. And I look forward to hearing Annalisa and Maria's responses and everybody else's later on. Our next speaker is Eduardo Pérez Navarro. Eduardo Pérez is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Granada in Spain, from which he also obtained an international PhD in 2019. His interest areas are philosophy of language and the philosophy of logic. He has been a visiting PhD student at the Institut Jean-Nicot in Paris and at the University of California, Berkeley, under the supervision of Isidora Stojanovic and Jock McFarlane, respectively. He has published papers in philosophical studies and uh, in res philosophica, Grazer Philosophische Studien, Theoria and Theorema. Uh, thank you very much, Eduardo, for being here. And uh, when you are ready, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, so let me begin by saying how honored I feel to have been invited to participate in this session. Uh, I would like to thank the organization for giving me the chance to discuss these important issues with such important philosophers. So the purpose of Bagramian and Koliva's book is twofold. On the one hand, it aims at identifying a consistent set of commitments shared by all theories that have been called relativist. And uh, on the other hand, it offers a battery of arguments against views that undertake these commitments. On page one of the book, Bagramian and Koliva uh, describe its aim as uh, to present as even handedly as possible reasons for or against some of the most prominent relativistic positions. But relativism is ultimately deemed unsound under every single construal considered uh, in the book. Um, the book's efforts along these two fronts are among, among the most comprehensive I have had the chance uh, to witness, and it has made me consider a lot of points to which I have not given enough attention before. Uh, but uh, I still remain unconvinced by some of the book's arguments against relativism, and part of the reason stems from my disagreement with the other's characterization of the, of the view. So in what follows, I will uh, first explain the sense in which I would characterize relativism in a different way from Bagramian and Koliva, and then uh, discuss the impact that revising the definition of relativism in this way would have on their argument. Um, I will focus on Bagramian and Koliva's characterization of relativism and their arguments against epistemic and moral relativism on which I specialize. So I will leave aside their survey of the history of relativism as well as their discussion 
of uh, conceptual relativism, constructivism, and uh, relativism about science. Bagramian and Kaliva characterized relativism uh, as committed to six claims on absolutism, dependence, multiplicity, incompatibility, equal validity, and non-neutrality. Non-absolutism in, uh, implies the denying that at least some truths or values in the relevant domain apply to all times, places, or social and cultural frameworks. Dependent uh, is uh, uh, the idea that uh, a given value X, be it concepts, facts, truth, good, permissibility, justification, or knowledge depends on parameter Y, such as languages, descriptions, cultures, and subjective evaluative standards. Multiplicity involves the assumption of a multiplicity of both the value X and the parameter Y on which such values depend. Incompatibility uh, implies that there is a genuine incompatibility in the sense of non-convergence between the values X can take as well as between the values the parameter Y can take. Um, equal validity means that uh, values of X determine on the basis of different parameters Y, thought incompatible are both equally valid or admissible. And non-neutrality finally is the idea that there is no Archimedean point of view or neutral criterion of evaluation available for adjudicating between the plurality of incompatible frameworks of different values of parameter Y, which determine different and compatible values of X. Bogramian and Koliva also devote a few lines uh, to discussing the relations between uh, some of these commitments. In particular, they say that non-absolutism, dependence, multiplicity, and incompatibility don't by themselves result in relativism. Moreover, they say that uh, the claim of equal validity follows from non-neutrality and from the refusal of absolutism. This seems to suggest that embracing non-neutrality is per se not enough uh, to qualify as a relativist, but it also suggests that for Bogramian and Koliva, embracing equal validity does amount to accepting uh, relativism. So I agree with Bogramian and Koliva's characterization in all respects, but one that, if my interpretation is correct, is quite an important one. Like Kush, I don't think relativism should be committed uh, to equal validity. And in fact, I think that the set of commitments specified by Brown and Koliva will be inconsistent unless we exclude equal validity from it. Of course, uh, Bagramian and Koliva may welcome this result as it could be used to base a further argument against uh, relativism if we take actual relativists to uh, be committed to equal validity. So I propose to understand non-neutrality in particular in such a way that instead of resulting in equal validity when combined with non-absolutism, it is in fact incompatible with equal validity. And my point is that in order to be able to say that all points of view are on a par as equal validity requires, we would have to jump over our own point of view to consider it at the same level as others. But this is precisely what non-neutrality precludes. Our evaluations are always done from our own point of view, so there is a sense in which we can't consider uh, a disagreement as a third party, which is what we would need to declare both positions equally right. The moment we uh, wonder which of the parties to a conversation is right, we uh, become participants in the, in the discussion. Uh, so I will uh, develop this uh, a little more in a while when I discuss Bagramian and Koliva's argument against relativism. And Bagramian and Koliva could reply that uh, once we have left equal validity out of the picture, we are no longer talking about uh, relativism, but I think we can still be said to be relativists insofar as we maintain commitments such as non-absolutism, dependence, and multiplicity. These commitments help us become aware that there are points of view uh, that, that are different from around and that there is a point of contingency to the views that we hold. And if relativism is characterized by a tolerant stance, these commitments are, are all we need uh, to obtain it. I will also develop this a little more uh, in a while. So, Bagramian and Koliva divide 
the views that they take to be committed to the six claims they identify into two broad families depending on how they are uh, motivated. Um, on the one hand, we have relativist views such as Cobalt's or McFarlane's that take the existence of Paul Tess agreement as the uh, historical starting point. And then on the other hand, uh, we have relativist views such as Robain's, whose aim is to make sense of the alternative intuition, that is the existence of perhaps just the possibility of alternatives in the sense of truths that can't be embraced together. Uh, Bagramian and Koliva have a different set of arguments against each of these families uh, of view uh, aimed at uh, proving that in the end, uh, relativism doesn't manage either to account for photos disagreement or to accommodate the alternative's intuition. So in what follows, I present these two sets of arguments in turn, but I will already reply to the first set as it is against it that I can use my point that relativists should understand non-neutrality in a way that precludes equal validity. So Bagramian and Koliva argument, uh, argue against uh, relativist views motivated by faultless agreement at several points throughout the book, but the structure of their arguments is always uh, similar. The starting point is that if there is no fault involved in a conversational exchange, it can't be an instance of disagreement. And if the two speakers disagree, they can't do so faultlessly. The first conditional holds, even if the standard at issue is not taken to be part of the proposition expressed, even if the asserted content can't be held by the same person at the same time, speakers should be aware that they are to be evaluated relative to different standards, so there is no disagreement. After all, and in, in response to the second conditional for its part, the relativist can say that there is disagreement in as much as each speaker holds a standard to be the right one, but then on the one hand, the previous argument can be repeated for the disagreement about standard. If it is a disagreement, it isn't faultless, and if it is faultless, it is not a disagreement. And uh, on the other hand, as soon as we move from the first to the second step, the disagreement is no longer about its original subject matter. Um, this kind of argument appears for the first time on page 11, and it, it is eventually used against Protagoras, Cobalt, McFarlane, Wright, and relativism understood as per perspectivalism, and a simpler version of the of the argument is used against uh, views that might be deemed contextualist, such as the replacement model, uh, epistemic contextualism, uh, Harman's proposal, and simple indexical relativism. Um, now, uh, Bagramian and Koliva's argument against uh, relativist views based on the alternative uh, intuition is this. Um, versions of relativism, such as, uh, such as uh, Robain's, uh, need for some pairs of truths to be unable to be held together while not being contradictories, because if they were, Bagramian and Koliva could rely on their argument against relativist views based on faultless disagreement. But if these truths are not contradictories, in what sense can they be held together? Robain's answer is that they belong to different worlds, this is what allows a person to reject another person's beliefs, even if she doesn't take them to be false. However, pairs of beliefs that belong to different worlds are neither consistent nor inconsistent. Uh, and Bagramian and Koliva claim that this move requires a kind of logical revisionism that should only be embraced if the benefits of such a radical change in our view of truth would outweigh its cost. So, I will not reply here to Bagramian and Kaliva's argument against uh, alternative relativism as advanced before, because I don't think that a relativist uh, need to find a sense in which some truths can be held together without them being contradictories, as they can take these truths to be contradictories and still allow for the disagreement that uh, stems between speakers who hold them to be faultless in a sense to be specified in a while. So uh, in a sense, the fact that I have uh, 
I think I have a reply to Bagramian and Kaliva's arguments against uh, relativist views motivated by faultless disagreement is in itself a reply to the uh, to the arguments against uh, alternatives relativism, and the answer is something like there is uh, there is no puzzle because one of the uh, horn, one of the horns of the supposed dilemma isn't problematic after all. Um, now, I think my previous discussion um, of the features that should characterize relativism might contribute to shedding some light on what I take to be a weakness in Bagramian and, and Kaliva's argument against, uh, uh, against um, relativist views motivated by faultless disagreement. So I have rejected uh, that relativism implies equal validity and Bagramia and Koliva might say that if we do this, relativism will be unable to account for the faultlessness of faultless agreement as uh, the fact that faultless agreement is faultless implies uh, equal validity as uh, they actually say uh, in our footnote. But I think we can have faultless agreement without equal validity as all that is needed for a disagreement to be faultless is that no participant in it is at fault with respect to a context. And relativism allows us to have this in virtue of uh, non-absolutism, dependence, and multiplicity. And together, these commitments allow us to become aware that what other people think, even if wrong by our standards, may be correct by theirs. This is actually the only sense I can conceive of in which a disagreement might be said to be faultless. And making room for this kind of disagreement is all we need to uh, account for the fact that tolerance is a possibility. Now to say that none of the participants in the conversation is a fault simpliciter would require us to be applying two standards at the same time and non-neutrality precludes us from doing this. Um, moreover, uh, taking equal validity out of the list of commitments that characterize relativism, I think allows us to avoid one of the most feared consequences of uh, relativism, that is the possibility that it forces us to suspend of judgment about issues that don't allow for such comfort, uh, a possibility that is considered by Bagramin and Kaliva themselves in the book. This would indeed follow from uh, relativism if it were compatible with our considering two points of view at the same time, but thanks to relativism, commitment to non-neutrality and its corresponding rejection of equal validity, this is just not possible uh, for us. We have to pronounce ourselves. So I have uh, defended, uh, I have developed this defense of uh, relativism in a paper that uh, came out this year. Um, so to end with, I have uh, presented uh, my comment to Bagramian and Kaliva's book as a list of uh, criticisms, <clears throat> some of them pertaining to the characterization of relativism, some of them uh, to the argument against it. But of course, uh, my comment could have also taken the list, uh, the form of a list of questions that uh, when answered could contribute to strengthening the, the position. So these are, so given the previous considerations, these are some issues on which I would like to hear uh, the author's uh, thoughts. So can we have relativism without equal validity? Can we have faultless disagreement without equal validity? And how should non-neutrality be understood? So uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts on this. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And now we will have our five minutes break just for transition. Um, let me introduce Paul Bogosian. He's Silva Professor of Philosophy at the New York University, where he's currently chair of the department, having also held the position for 10 years from 1994 to 2004. His research interests include epistemology, the philosophy of mind, and the philosophy of language. He is also director of the New York Institute of Philosophy and the director of NYU's Global Institute for Advanced Study. He Martin. has made 
various uh, contributions to relativism, including his book, Fear of Knowledge Against Relativism and Constructivism. We are very happy to have you, Paul. Welcome. Susanna, thank you. Thank you to you and to Drew for organizing this uh, excellent symposium. Um, and congratulations to, to the two authors. I'm so sorry Maria is not able to be here, but to, to Annalisa um, and Maria for this uh, very clear and, and compendious book. It's, it's really wonderful to have it. And one of the things that was uh, interesting to see is the way in which uh, the um, this sort of relativist, what looks to be the relativist desire to, as John puts it, square the circle uh, over and over again runs into this uh, dilemma, which is either that, you know, the conflict is not a real disagreement or it's not really faultless. And so somehow or other, um, um, comes under strain uh, from the intuitive demands that are being put on it. Now, unlike the other commentators who are often the targets of these criticisms, I, I, I had a hard time uh, figuring out what to uh, write a critical comment on since I agreed with so much. Uh, there's a wonderful sentence that Donald Davidson uses um, where he says about somebody, there's uh, a lot that I agree with and even more that I admire. And uh, that's true in this case too. But I did find this one interesting argument um, against Harmon's conventionalist social constructionist view of morality, which struck me as, as interesting and, and original. I don't think I've seen that argument anywhere else. And so I thought, uh, yeah, I'd like to see what what there is to it and whether it stands up. And so I uh, devoted my uh, comments to that. So in a way it's a bit of, it's different from the, all the other commentators who are defending the possibility of relativism. Um, but, you know, um, a little bit of variety is probably a good thing too. So um, Harman, as you know, has this uh, conventionalist social constructionist view of morality, according to which, uh, you know, what you might naively take to be a moral truth, like uh, no torture is wrong to inflict pain on a human being just for one's own amusement, is really just a norm that has a societal norm that has been established by convention, hammered out through negotiation and tacit agreement by those who are in a position to do so. And, um, B and C, as I will call them, if that's okay, develop an interesting argument against Harman's view. Uh, this argument claims that his view could not be correct because the conditions needed for morality to have been established conventionally cannot obtain. Um, now, um, as they know, Tarman regards morality as similar to other social institutions that have been established in a conventional manner. For example, legal systems, languages, or games. They quote the following passage from a later paper of Harman's, not the, not the book, in which he says, um, moralities can also be compared with games where at least in part defined by their rules, football, baseball, soccer ball, chess, Often there are several versions of the game with minor differences in their rules. Some aspects of the rules of the game or a morality might be describable propositionally, but participants will not be able to provide full and complete descriptions. Roughly speaking, to be engaged in a particular game or morality is to be disposed or committed to acting in certain ways. Um, so, here is the passage from, uh, from Maria and Annalisa's book where they develop the argument against this view. They say, a second difficulty arises from the conditions, this is a quote, by the way, my comments have been shared, yeah, you can follow along. Um, a second difficulty arises from the conditions for establishing a set of moral conventions. Harmon, as we saw, claims that moral relativism is like football relativism, 
where the sensible idea is that there are different actual and possible versions of football with different rules. Whether something deserves a penalty is relative to which version of football is being played. Rules of football are decided by negotiations and by establishing conventions. When it comes to ethics, negotiations or even implicit decisions about adopting a convention can take place only if the relevant participants are already able to make value judgments. That is to say, only if one knows what is meant by good, evil, and the like, and how to apply these normative concepts, can one start discussing whether something is good or not too good, some actions, morally obligatory, and so forth. To formulate an ethical system, you have to have prior access to the normative domain. Therefore, it's not obvious that ethical values are a product of pure agreement between parties. And that's the end of the quote. Now, the idea seems to be that when it comes to football, you don't need to possess or grasp the football concepts prior to conventionally establishing what football means and what rules are to govern its play. You can just say, look, let's play a game, call it football. Each side will have a goal and the objective of the game is blah, blah, blah. The use of the hands will be penalized and so forth. Clearly, we're not talking about American football here. It shouldn't really be called football, but anyway. However, when it comes to establishing a moral convention, they say, you do need prior access to the central moral concepts as well as knowledge of how to apply them. And so B and C conclude somewhat peremptorily, it is not obvious that ethical values are a product of pure agreement between parties. Now, I think, as I say, this is an interesting and original argument. In, in form, it's reminiscent of Quine's famous argument against logical conventionalism, which goes something like this. The logical conventionalist says that logical truths are the result of conventional stipulations of the meanings of the logical constants by way of a stipulation about which sentences of logic involving them are, and which inferences involving them are to count as valid. Against this, Quine points out that there are an infinite number of truths of logic. They couldn't have been stipulated one by one. Rather, some general conventions would need to be laid down and accepted. For example, all inferences of the modus ponens form are valid. But such general conventions would necessarily involve use of the logical constants, including especially the universal quantifier and the conditional. So it could not be true that all logical truths are laid down by convention. To lay down some logical conventions, you would need prior access to the logical domain, to, to paraphrase, to mirror the phrasing being used, in particular prior access to certain logical concepts and knowledge of how to use them. BNC's argument is strikingly parallel in form, but applied to the moral domain rather than the logical one. Now, I think even though Quine's argument is, I think, ultimately resistible, although, and as I kind of point out in, in my paper on analytics to be considered, and Jared Warren has worked out in a book, in a recent book, um, it does have a very immediate appeal. You can sort of see exactly why somebody would be tempted to say that. And, and the resistance is, is while well possible, not, not, doesn't leap out at you. But the same could not be said for B and C's argument. That is, it's neither immediately clear that the premise, which is to establish a moral convention, you need prior access to moral concepts and knowledge of how to apply them. But that premise is true, nor is it clear exactly how the conclusion follows from the premise, even if the latter were granted, namely the bridging claim, if premise is true, then ethical value could not be the result of pure agreement between parties. So let me first look at the premise. Why do we need to have prior access to moral concepts if we're to establish some moral conventions? This raises the interesting prior question, what does it take to conventionally establish a moral norm in the society? 
Well, if we think of establishing a moral norm as getting the members of the society to accept, believe a set of general moral propositions, and you know, sometimes Harman does talk that way, with moral concepts as part of their contents, for example, anti-slavery, slavery is morally prohibited, that proposition, then per perhaps premise would be correct because if you were to negotiate over whether to accept a proposition like anti-slavery or its opposite within a given society, you would need to understand those propositions antecedent to the negotiation. But it's not clear that establishing a moral norm involves folks accepting moral propositions any more than it's clear that establishing a logic, at least in one good sense of that phrase, necessarily involves accepting logical propositions. In both of these cases, what may be involved in setting up a societal norm is establishing a certain kind of practice. And of course, Harman alludes to that at the very end of that first quote from him that I read, where he said people will be unable to give complete descriptions. Really what is going on is a certain kind of behavioral uh, institution. In the case of logic, this would involve establishing that certain patterns of inference are acceptable and others aren't. To get around Quine's point, this establishing of what's good and bad by way of inference couldn't be done by laying down some general propositions that everyone would have to accept. It would rather have to be done without the use of language behaviorally. And we know that this is doable in practice since language is conventional and so its conventions would have to have been established wordlessly in the way that Lewis tried to elucidate in his book, Convention. Similarly, it might be thought a moral norm that a given act A is wrong could be conventionally established wordlessly by sanctioning those who do A, teaching the young not to do A, feeling certain negative emotions such as anger or resentments towards those who do A and so forth. For this reason then, I think it's not clear I, that premise is true, maybe I, I'm, um, maybe there's some other way in which the premise could be motivated, but uh, it would be, um, I don't know what that is. So turning next to the bridging claim, the bridging claim, remember, is um, if premise is true, then ethical value could not be the result of pure agreement between parties. Um, let's grant premise for the purposes of argument and see whether the bridging claim is true. Um, let's assume that if we are to establish moral norms by convention, we need to have antecedent access to the central moral concepts. Why would this undermine Harman's claim that moral truths are purely conventional social constructs? Um, I think what they have in mind is something along the lines of uh, A, B, C that I've put down on comments. A, having access to the moral concepts and knowledge of how to apply them involves having some beliefs about what's in the extension of quotes right and quotes wrong. So believing some moral claims is antecedent to establishing moral norms. So not all moral claims could have been established by convention some moral claims would be presupposed by the very process of establishing others. Um, I think the argument seems valid, but, but what's the argument for A? Uh, why would having the concept of wrong involve having some beliefs about, uh, or having some canonical, I guess, set of beliefs about what's in its extension? Well, there are, of course, various metasemantical views on which having a concept involves accepting either some sentences or inferences involving it. For example, having conjunction and involves endor endorsing the standard introduction elimination rules and possessing triangle involves endorsing a certain definition and so on. If this kind of conceptual role view were applied to moral concepts, then it would follow that having moral concepts would involve having moral beliefs. If we go along with this, it would follow that not all moral claims that we accept could have been the result of negotiation and agreement. Some of them would have to have been acquired in some other way. Um, 
by being hardwired into us, for example, as a condition of establishing the others by convention. But surely this does not threaten anything of great significance to Harmon's anti-realist picture, just because some moral claims might have been hardwired into us by evolution, say, uh, because it was adaptive to do so, would not imply realism about values. To say that we are so hardwired that we can't help but believe certain moral claims is not the same as saying that there are objective moral values, still less ones that are universally binding. After all, saying that we're all predisposed to accept certain moral claims is entirely compatible with Mackey's error view about the whole of morality. To think otherwise would be to conflate descriptive universalism with normative universalism, which is uh, um, versions of, it, of, of concepts that, uh, that Maria and Annalisa are very careful to distinguish between. Now, signs of this possible conflation show up when B and C say that Harmon comes close to conceding their overall argument when he draws parallels between moral systems and language as that, is, as that notion is used in Chomsky and linguistics. So I quote, um, an I language in generative linguistics is an innate universal endowment of the human mind brain, which then manifests itself through differing parameters and principles in different idiolects, such as English and French. In the same way, Harmon proposes that we can make sense of the presence of moral systems across all human cultures by postulating a universal innate core I morality determined by some principles and parameters on issues such as autonomy, authority ranking, and community sharing. Different ethical systems can then be seen as idiolects of this core I morality Harmon's hypothesis is interesting and worthy of further investigation, but it is a major concession to the universality of at least some basic ethical norms. Once we accept this idea of the core I morality, it's no longer clear how much will be left of the metaphysical claim about the nature of morality that we began with. Um, you see, I think this isn't right. I think you, you suppose you took this parallel between I language and I morality seriously, what would follow? In the case of language, we would be committed to supposing that certain parameterized rules of grammar are universally shared with different languages, setting the values of those parameters in different ways. But of course, it's quite clear that nothing about realism follows from that, the, <laughs> as we can see from the fact that nobody is tempted to be as it were a realist about grammar in the sense that, uh, that as it were, there is a platonic reality to which the, the, the I language that, that we have would have to be uh, responsible to. No, it's just that um, for this practice to get off the ground, certain things have to be in place and and nothing follows about, as it were, whether this thing that has to be in place is or is not uh, responsive to a reality beyond itself. Similarly, in the case of morality, we would be committed to supposing that certain abstract parameterized principles of morality were universally shared um, with different societies setting the values of those parameters in different ways. Of course, whatever exactly those principles are taken to be, they had better be compatible with the sheer diversity of moral values that we observe in the world at large, the diversity, the diversity that we saw Harmon noting above. But now let's suppose that such a picture is true, and let's even suppose that this core I morality includes substantive moral claims, like it's wrong to inflict pain on a fellow human being just for one's own amusement. Would it follow that Harmon's metaphysical claim that there are no objective values out there, but that all values are socially constructed, could not be true? Obviously not for the reasons given above. So even if we agreed that for one or another reason, all human beings had to share certain moral views, that would not by itself threaten a social constructionist view of morality. I suppose that one claim that would be threatened is the claim that all moral norms are established by convention. If believing some moral claims were a precondition for conventionally establishing others, we should have to modify the metaphysical claim to all moral claims are either hardwired into us 
or are socially constructed. This modification, however, is entirely compatible with the denial of realism about moral value. As a matter of fact, I think it's importantly not true that it is a condition of establishing a system of moral norms by convention that we need to presuppose any particular moral belief, even if we admit that constructionists must have prior access to the central moral concepts in order to do any constructing of norms. By the way, that's still granting the premise, which I think actually is false. But even granting it, um, to see um, why no particular moral belief would be presupposed, we need to ask ourselves exactly what is and what is not constitutive of possession of the central moral concepts. The non-negotiable minimal core of a moral concept is its normative role. In the case of a positive concept like morally right, its constitutive ties to praise, motivation, and positive emotions. In the case of a negative concept, its constitutive ties to criticism, blame, and resentment. Let's call the view that moral concepts consist wholly of their normative roles with no substantive conception of what falls under them, a minimalist view of those concepts, and call the view according to which they harbor substantive views about which acts fall in their extensions, a substantive view. Consider a negative concept such as wrong, and let's simplify our account of its normative role so that at its core, wrong is used to mount a certain distinctive type of criticism of an act, a distinctively moral criticism of that act. When we imagine a substantive version of wrong, what we are imagining is a concept with this critical normative role at its core, to which has been super added a substantive conception of which acts are deserving of that type of criticism. On a substantive view of wrong, for example, the principle no torture might be analytic. It might be part of the grasp of the concept wrong. Now the insight I think at the heart of Moore's open question argument is that a substantive view of moral concepts is incorrect and that a minimal view is correct. We can see this by employing a version of his argument on the claim that someone might make that no torture is analytic so that anyone who understood the concept wrong would have to affirm it. Moore saw that so long as someone understood the core normative role of wrong, they could sensibly doubt whether no torture was true without thereby surrendering their grasp of the concept wrong. They would exhibit their grasp by showing that saying that something is wrong is to say that it has constitutive ties to certain kinds of motivation, criticism, and emotion, even while disputing that this or that particular act type falls under it. Since our basic moral concepts are just bare normative roles, they engender no contradiction when applied to any act, no matter how clearly that act may fall outside their extensions. And since they are just bare normative roles, that means that no substantive verdict about right and wrong can be epistemically analytic. Notice that this is not true of other concepts. Someone who doubted whether a simple quadrilateral has four sides would have surrendered their grasp of the concept. So if this argument is correct, moral concepts at their core are mere devices for a certain distinctive kind of praise or blame and do not incorporate substantive views about what, if anything, falls under their extensions. Thus, even if we conceded that conventionalists about morality need to have access to moral concepts in order to set up their conventions, that would leave room for maximal disagreement about which moral claims to establish and which ones to reject, at least insofar as the limits imposed by our understanding of the relevant concept is concerned. Thus, it would leave a social constructivist view of morality intact. Ironically then, there may be more limits to football conventionalism than there are to moral conventionalism. If you're setting up conventions concerning football, you are limited, I guess, to games in which the use of hands would have to be minimal and the main means by which the goal of winning has to be achieved has to involve the feet. Whereas in the case of morality, there are no conceptual limits as to which norms are endorsed and which ones are rejected. Thank you. That's Awesome. Thanks a lot, Paul. We are going to have a five-minute break now.
So it's my, my great pleasure to introduce Professor John McFarlane from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Professor McFarlane is a member of the group in logic and the methodology of science and a co-organizer of the Meaning Sciences Club and the Townsend Center Worker, Working Group in the History and Philosophy of Logic, Mathematics and Science. His areas of interest are the philosophy of language and the philosophy of logic. He has recently published a handbook in the philosophy of, um, of um, logic, and uh, uh, he has, uh, uh, he's also authored uh, a very important book on relativity, uh, which is called Assessment Sensitivity, Relative Truth and Supplication. Thank you very much, Professor McFarlane, for joining us today. So when you like, the floor is yours. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to have Drew share the text of my talk, as others have done, um, instead of using slides. All right, so I applaud uh, Maria and Annalisa, who I'll uh, call B and C going forward, as Paul did, uh, for writing this book. I think it's the first comprehensive book on relativism, relativism that actually makes a serious effort to engage with the extensive 21st century uh, literature on relativism and analytic philosophy, um, and to put it in dialogue with the earlier relativist tradition. So I think that's a very good thing to have. The book has an enormous scope. Relativism, as they think of it, seems to be a tent big enough to hold Protagoras, Nietzsche, William Hamilton, David Bloor, Nelson Goodman, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Bruno Latour, Thomas Kuhn, Lorraine Code, Gil Harman, Carol Rovain, and Peter Lazarson. Um, I think it's an interesting exercise to look at all these different positions as instances of a single kind, but I'm a bit skeptical of the effort made in chapter one to delineate that kind by giving a set of necessary conditions or essential features. Uh, these are the things that Eduardo went through, non-absolutism, dependence, multiplicity, incompatibility, and equal validity. If these are going to apply to the whole big tent, they've got to be formulated in an extremely vague way. Um, I would think that relativism in the broad sense that this book seems to be going for would better be thought of as a family resemblance concept. Now, interestingly, left outside of the big tent are contextualist views, which they think do not accept anti-absolutism and therefore are excluded. Uh, so here's a quote. They say, it's important to note that multiplicity is not sufficient for relativism. For instance, contextual proposals, let them be in semantics, uh, talking about Keith the Rose's uh, contextualism about knowledge attributions or an epistemology, uh, allow for it, but they also restrict each verdict to a specific insulated context. Thus, for instance, it may be known that P in a low stakes context and not known that P in a high stakes one, while P being the same content in the two descriptions of knowledge or lack thereof. And within each context, it's known or not known that P, absolutely. Okay, so I take it that epistemic contextualism is ruled out, it's outside of the relativist big tent. Now, I would have thought that in the broad sense of relativism, you could count as a relativist, for example, if you thought that aesthetic judgments always involved an implicit reference to a standard of taste, but that there were many legitimate standards of taste, none of which are privileged over the others. This is the sense in which we're all relativists about three o'clock p.m. Um, because this sort of view is a kind of contextualism, it would seem to be excluded by the considerations just given. Um, and that's a bit surprising because I would have thought that that is a, a kind of paradigm case of uh, aesthetic relativism. I've argued elsewhere that Protagoras's view is actually best understood as a form of contextualism. And if that's right, then he falls outside of the big tent too. But I don't think that B and C are entirely consistent on this issue because uh, they spend, for example, 10 pages in chapter nine uh, discussing Gil Harmon's moral relativism as Paul was just talking about. That's a view that's explicitly cashed out as kind of contextualism. Uh, so I was a bit confused about the apparent exclusion of contextualist views here. Now, in my own work, I prefer to use the term relativism more narrowly. I myself want to use it in a way that excludes contextualism. So I use it for the view, the sort of view that allows uh, two judgments or assertions that genuinely disagree to be in some sense both correct. 
and not just correct in an epistemic sense of being justified or warranted. This kind of characterization does exclude contextualism since on contextualist views, there isn't any real disagreement. If I say I'm cold and you say I'm not cold, we don't disagree with each other. But it also includes forms of relativism. Uh, it, it also excludes forms of relativism that would invoke conceptual incommensurability because these sorts of views um, are going to make both agreement and disagreement impossible. So I use relativism in a bit narrower way. The advantage I think of doing that is that uh, if you think of relativism that way, it isolates a pretty definite philosophical problem that has to be solved to vindicate the view. And that's the problem of reconciling the disagrees and the both are correct parts of the characterization, which seem on the face of it to be incompatible with each other. So I'll call that the relativist task. B and C discuss my attempts to square this circle in chapter three and parts of chapter eight of their book. So mostly I'm going to confine my comments to, to those sections. Now a natural first step in the direction of reconciling the disagrees and both are correct idea is to allow that the contents of our assertions and judgments, for example, the proposition we express using a sentence like that's tasty, have truth values not just relative to a state of the world, but relative to something like a taste. That kind of move would allow the same proposition to be true in the actual world relative to one person's taste, but false relative to another's. And so it would allow one party to assert that licorice is tasty and another party to assert the contradictory proposition that licorice is not tasty. And for both to have said something that is true relative to their respective tastes. If you hold that an assertion is correct, absolutely, if it's true relative to the speaker's taste at the context of use, then we can say that both these assertions, the assertion that licorice is tasty in one context and the assertion that it's not tasty in another, are correct, correct absolutely, even though they disagree. Max Koble ably defended this sort of view in his book, uh, 2002 book, Truth Without Objectivity. Now in my work, I've argued that this isn't quite enough to accomplish the relativist task. This view does secure a kind of disagreement because after all the two parties believe and assert incompatible propositions and neither party could accept the proposition that the other accepts without a change in view. And so you might think of that as a kind of disagreement. Um, it's what I call in my book, doxastic non-cotenability. But you might think that real disagreement requires more than that. It requires thinking that the other person has got it wrong, um, has made a mistake, has got an incorrect view. Views that relativize the truth of propositions but allow the correctness of assertions and judgment to be absolute aren't going to secure that. In the kind of example we just looked at, both parties can agree that the others Assertion is correct, absolutely. So I've called views like this non-indexical contextualism in recognition of their kinship as regards the absoluteness of correctness and the absence of robust disagreement with standard indexical contextualism. Um, no, of course, there's there's a lot of room for debate here, and I know I know Max is going to say yes, that's that's disagreement enough, um, and he made a case for that in his comments. But uh, B and C agree with my diagnosis. Um, they agree that that's not disagreement enough. They formulate a criterion for disagreement that imposes an additional condition beyond doxastic non-cotenability or beyond the incompatibility of the propositions, which they call the aboutness condition. And this says that acceptance of these contents concerns the same circumstances. On non-indexical contextualist views, assertions concern the circumstance of the context of use. That's the only context that's relevant for evaluating their correctness. So taste judgments in different contexts do not meet this necessary condition, the aboutness condition for disagreement, what they call the aboutness condition. To secure a more robust kind of disagreement, I've argued, we need to think of the truth of judgments as relative both to a context of use and to a context of assessment. This move, allows us to introduce a notion of accuracy that is not absolute, but relative to context of assessment. 
an assertion of P, proposition P at C1 is gonna be accurate as assessed from another context C2, just in case P is true as used at C1 and assessed from C2. So an assertion of licorice is tasty at one context can be accurate as assessed from that context and inaccurate as assessed from another. This gives us a kind of disagreement, I think, that's stronger than mere doxastic non-cotenability because now both parties to this disagreement can agree that the accuracy of one party's assertion precludes the accuracy of the others. Now, they're going to, of course, disagree about which one is the accurate one and which one is the inaccurate one, but they're both going to agree that one is accurate and the other is inaccurate, um, in contrast to non index contextualism, where both can agree that both are accurate. So I call the kind of disagreement we have here, where only one of the claims can be accurate, preclusion of joint accuracy. That gets the idea that when you disagree with someone, you take them to got it wrong. Now note that on this view, taste assertions do not concern any specific taste. That's something I argue in my book. Um, hence, trivially, they concern the same circumstances. And I think the aboutness condition is met, contrary to what B and C allege. Okay. What's the practical significance of this notion of accuracy? Gareth Evans, in his uh, posthumously published paper on uh, tense logic, famously denied that we could make sense of a relativized notion of correctness, but I disagree with that. Um, what I've argued is that a relativized notion of accuracy can figure in norms for assertion and retraction in the following way. Um, so two norms, one norm for asserting, the assertion norm. One ought to make only assertions that are accurate as assessed relative to one's current context, the context you're in when you're asserting it. Second norm, retraction norm. One ought to retract earlier assertions that are not accurate as assessed relative to your current context, the context you're in assessing the earlier assertion, which of course could be different from the context you were in when you made the assertion. Given these norms, the difference between non-indexical contextualism and relativism is gonna come down to this. Both views will predict that one ought to assert that licorice is tasty only if licorice is tasty according to one's taste at the current context that you're in when you're making the assertion. But the views will diverge in their predictions about when that assertion ought to be retracted. If one's taste changed so that licorice is no longer tasty according to one's current taste, then the non-indexical contextualist will still regard the earlier assertion as accurate and hold that you're not obliged to retract it. The relativist, by contrast, is gonna hold that the earlier assertion must be retracted because it's not accurate relative to one's current context. So, so that's a place where the difference between the views comes out most clearly. So the retraction norm is gonna give a direct significance to inaccuracy for one's own assertions um, when you're thinking about them at different contexts. And if you think about the idea of disagreeing with your past self, you'll already begin to see why a relativist can do better than non-indexical contextualists at securing um, real disagreement. When it comes to other people's assertions, you've got to see the significance of the norm a bit more indirectly. So the mere fact that someone else's assertion is inaccurate as assessed from your context doesn't require them to retract it, right? Because the retraction norm says they should retract it if as assessed from the context they're in, it's inaccurate. But if their context were to change in the right way, if their tastes were to change, for example, then they would be required to retract for that reason. So a change in the other's context can affect whether they're obligated to retract. And this is something that sets relativism apart from both contextualism and objectivism. You might concede that the kind of disagreement I've described here is more robust than what we have with non indexical contextualism, but object that it still falls short of real disagreement, the kind you get about genuinely objective matters like the age of the earth or something like that. Um, and that's what I call preclusion of joint reflexive accuracy in the book. I'm perfectly happy to accept that charge. I think that's a feature of the view, not a bug. We should respect the phenomena. Disagreements about taste seem like real disagreements in many respects. They can persist even after the parties recognize that they have different tastes, but still they seem different from 
disagreements about, say, the age of the earth, because we understand that they're going to be resolved in different ways, not by uncovering new facts, but by cultivating different tastes. And once you see that, once we see that um, there's this kind of disagreement that's more robust than non doxastic non cotenability but, but still less robust than what you have about genuinely objective matters, then I think we should start to avoid using the phrase real disagreement, which misleadingly presupposes that there's only one thing worth calling disagreement. Okay, so that's something I argue in chapter six of my book. Now, let me turn to the objections that B and C have raised about my attempt to square the circle. Their central objection is that I privilege the assessor's perspective in a way that's preventing me from making sense of the idea that the other party's perspective has, quote, uh, equal validity. Remember, equal validity is supposed to be one of the essential features of a genuinely relativist view. So if I don't get that, I'm not really a relativist. So the very move that allows me to secure the more robust kind of disagreement, preclusion of joint accuracy, they think precludes me from recognizing something that's essential to relativism, namely the legitimacy of the other party's perspectives. So here's one representative passage where they say something like this. By insisting that disputes about taste display disagreement in the sense of preclusion of joint accuracy, McFarland seems able to explain why people respond by saying no to what the other party is saying, why they may retract their earlier views, why they may try to have having the other retract, However, the rationality of that aspect of their practice, if one adopts McFarland's semantics, is only apparent. For it was also an initial datum of that practice that each party is making an accurate judgment from their own perspective. So with what right does one assess it from one's own position? Furthermore, doing so has an effect on the dispute for it trumps the perspective that returned an opposite verdict on the matter at issue by making it seem incorrect even from that perspective. Now, I don't know if I fully understand the charge here, and, and perhaps this is something that Annalisa will, will clarify in, in her response. Uh, but it, I worry that the argument supporting this rests on, on two mistaken moves. The first is a failure to keep in mind the distinction between disagreement in the activity sense and disagreement in the state sense. I say keep in mind because they're aware of this distinction, they note the distinction, but I don't think they make use of it where they should. So consider the following passage from page 82. They say, if apprised of their situation of occupying different contexts of assessment, each of the contenders should agree that within their context of assessment, the other is right to believe the proposition true, false, even though they themselves regard it as false or true within their own context of assessment. In such a situation, disputes would, should not continue. Everyone should agree, if they were rational, that the other is assessing the same proposition while occupying a different context of assessment, and that therefore the other side is right according to its standards. The discussion should just end there with the acknowledgement of a draw. Now, like Max in his comments, I think that this underestimates that a degree to which one can change another's taste through discussion by calling attention to features, drawing analogies, and so on. But leave that aside. It's true that in many disputes of taste, we just hit a wall. Our attempts to bring the other person to our way of seeing things go nowhere, and we move on to more productive topics of conversation. But that just brings a stop to our disagreement in the activity dispense, in, in the activity sense, our dispute. It doesn't make our disagreement in the state sense go away. We still think the other party is wrong. We're not at all inclined to say, yes, you were right. You are right all along. Indeed, one sometimes hits this kind of wall in discussion about perfectly objective matters. And the fact that I've given up disputing whether there's human caused climate change with my Trumpian neighbor doesn't mean we no longer disagree. It just means we no longer see much more point in engaging in further discussion. So I think we should be suspicious of any argument from the irrationality of continued disputes on a matter to the irrationality of my sort of relativism. Here's another instance of, of what I think is this slide from chapter eight. Our contention is that if a relativist, this is what they say, our contention is that if a relativist 
did think about how they fit together, she would have to recognize that the other person is right given her context of assessment. And therefore that there's no point in going on disputing. But if there's no point in disputing and that practice is based on ignorance of the real normative trappings of the discourse at hand, then there is no reason to prefer McFarland's semantics over rival ones because of its superiority and accounting for disagreement and retraction. But no point in going on disputing just doesn't imply no point in going on disagreeing in the state sense. And that's the thing that's important here. All right, now the second mistake in their thinking concerns what they call equal validity. And, and I'm actually not quite sure which of two mistakes it is, but I think it's one or the other of two. So equal validity is one of their essential features of relativism. Of course, as they acknowledge, uh, and it, as Eduardo pointed out, many relativists have explicitly disavowed equal validity. I'm prepared to believe that there's a suitably weak and vague formulation of equal validity that um, might apply throughout the big tent of relativists that they're considering. But when they're criticizing my view for failing to vindicate equal validity, I, I think they seem to have something extremely strong in mind. So here's a quote from page 84. By invoking a specific point of view, the one of the assessor for evaluating a given belief or assertion, and by being able to salvage disagreement among parties and retraction only by so doing, McFarland seems to have betrayed the overall philosophical motivation for going relativist. True, there may be multiple assessors, but each of them will assess the truth or falsity of their propositions, absolutely. That is, none of them could make room within their context of assessment for the idea that different verdicts are equally legitimate. That is, from one context of assessment, if someone else judges false, sushi is tasty, they're wrong and have made a mistake. By contrast, it seemed the essence of relativism, particularly in the context of taste discourse, that opposite parties to a debate could recognize, perhaps after the first moves of the conversation, that the other party is equally right and entitled to their view. I find this charge puzzling because on my view, it seems to me there certainly is a sense in which each opposing party can recognize that the other party is entitled to their view. Both parties can recognize that given the norms for assertion and retraction, the other party was in their rights to assert what they did, since it, what they asserted, is accurate as assessed from the context in which they asserted it, and can recognize that they're not obliged to retract it now, since it's accurate as assessed from their present context. These facts about the correctness of particular acts of assertion or retraction um, are non-epistemic, since an assertion can be correct in this sense, even without being epistemically warranted, and they're absolute. But there is another non-epistemic sense of correctness, namely what I've called accuracy, which is perspectival. The kind of disagreement we have in relativist discourse precludes joint correctness in the latter sense, it precludes joint accuracy, but it doesn't preclude joint correctness in the former sense. It doesn't preclude both parties from having conformed to the norms for asserting and retract the govern the practice. So one possibility is that behind their puzzling charge that the two parties in my relativist practice assess the truth and accuracy of each other's claims absolutely, is, is that these parties express their retraction, their rejection of the other's view by using monadic predicates, false and inaccurate. You might say, no, that's inaccurate or that's false. What you think. But we shouldn't conflate monadicity and absoluteness. The statement P is inaccurate doesn't commit the speaker to the absolute inaccuracy of P on my view, because on my view, the monadic predicate inaccurate is an assessment sensitive predicate. Asserting that P is inaccurate is in fact perfectly compatible with asserting that P is accurate as assessed from someone else's context. So I think there's a perfectly reasonable sense of equal validity which my sort of relativist can accept. Now there's another possible, possible explanation of, of the thinking here. Um, it may be that B and C are construing equal validity in a much more demanding sense than I can vindicate a sense which rules out this nuanced attitude I've uh, sketched towards the correctness of others' judgments. They might hold that if you take another's tastes or standards to lead them systematically to make judgments that are inaccurate by your own lights, 
then ipso facto, you don't recognize these tastes or standards as legitimate or on par in the sense that's required by equal validity. Now, I think it's clear that if we understand equal validity in this more stringent sense and demand that any genuine form of relativism respect this, then relativism can't be a position that reconciles equal validity with persistent disagreement. For disagreeing with someone in any minimally robust sense, I think, requires thinking that they've got it wrong. Now that may seem to leave open the possibility that relativism is a position that reveals apparent disagreements to be merely apparent. So maybe that's how they're thinking of it. But as I noted with surprise at the outset, the contextualist views, which seem to do exactly that, were deemed non-relativist from the start. So I'm left with a bit of a confusion. According to B and C, I can't get into the relativist tent because I don't respect equal validity. And it seems perhaps Protagoras can't get in because he does respect it. So who do you have to know to become a member of this club? Thanks. Thank you very much, John. And now we are going to have 10 minutes break and we will come back in 10 minutes with Maria and uh, Annalisa's responses. Uh, thank you everybody and I will see you in 10 minutes. I would like to say a couple of words about Maria Bagramian as well, although unfortunately she's not here physically. So Maria Bagramian is full professor of American philosophy, head of the School of Philosophy and co-director of the Cognitive Science Program at University College Dublin in Ireland. She's also a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Her books include Relativism, published 2000, in 2004, Reading Putnam, published in 2013, Pragmatism and the European Traditions, published in 2017, and From Trust to Trustworthiness, published in 2019. Annalisa Kaliva is full professor, chancellor fellow and chair of the Department of Philosophy at the University of California in Irvine. Her authored books include Moore and Wittgenstein, Skepticism, Certainty and Common Sense, published in 2010, Extended Rationality, a Hinge Epistemology, published in 2015, and The Varieties of Self-Knowledge, published in 2016. For Rutledge, she's preparing a book on skepticism with Duncan Pritchard. And yeah, we are glad to get the responses now to the critics on their recent book, Relativism, published by Rutledge in 2019. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Maria, for organizing this marathon, <laughs> which um, is incredibly interesting. And thank you to all commentators for their very insightful comments. And um, so both Maria and I would like to thank you uh, for all your work on our book. Um, of course, I'm not going to cover each and every criticism that you leveled against our interpretations or um, arguments in the book, otherwise <laughs> we will never end. <laughs> so I'll just pick some elements from each commentator's comments and uh, we'll say something about those. Um, I'm going to start with Paul's comments because is the one art in the mix, as it were, is not the, rel the relativist in the mix or trying to defend any relativist position, not even of sorts. Um, I think that uh, we owe, both Maria and I owe a lot to Paul's way of looking at and criticizing relativism. Um, actually, I was a translator in Italian of his book, uh, Fear of Knowledge, many years ago, around 2006, I believe. And definitely uh, his way of uh, framing relativism and also criticizing it um, shapes a lot of the points that we make. But also, I think it's fair to say that our book is wider in scope and tries to be a little bit more, um, let's say, even-handed <laughs> towards relativism. We have maybe stronger sympathies than uh, polls towards relativism, or at least some of the sentiments, philosophical sentiments, <laughs> that uh, uh, one might think go together with the relativistic stance. So uh, let me start with Paul's um, comments. I would just like to say a few words about the, the gist of the argument uh, we make in the se section of the book commented upon. 
And the idea is that, uh, well, we are discussing Harman, but I won't focus my comments on Harman's proposal. Um, I think they are of more general interest. So the idea is that we need to know the meaning of morally right or wrong, to then conventionally determine what actions count as such. So we may negotiate whether you know abortion is right or wrong, morally from a moral point of view, or uh, same-sex marriage is right or wrong from a moral point of view, of course. And but to do that, we need to have a grasp of the of the meaning of someone might say the concept of morally right or wrong, unless a convention about these issues were merely arbitrary. So I decide to go, well, let's decide to stipulate and call morally wrong even torturing kids. I don't think that this notion of arbitrariness is part or should be part of any conventionist story. Now, if that is correct, then it is not simply a matter of agreement in definitions of morally right or wrong in the abstract, as it were, but also a matter of agreement about at least core applications or judgments regarding the expression morally right, wrong, or the concept, if you prefer to speak that way. In fact, typically definitions codify the features that paradigmatic cases of being morally right or wrong are thought to share. And indeed, to explain the meaning of morally right or wrong, we often give examples of actions that paradigmatically count as morally right or wrong. If upon reflection, while lucid and cognizant of all the relevant facts, you think that it is morally right or permissible to inflict torture on harmless creatures, and I don't, this shows that we do not agree about what counts as morally right or wrong to the point that we may not be agreeing about what those words mean or about what concept they express. Or I take it distinctively moral, and I underscore moral blame, is constitutively connected to the idea of harming others gratuitously. Now, regarding Paul's positive proposal, uh, remember that he uh, quotes the following, it's a quote, which is rather long, I'm gonna read. The non-negotiable um, minimal core of a moral concept is its normative role. In the case of a positive concept like morally right, it's constitutive ties to praise, motivation, and positive emotions. In the case of a negative concept, it's constitutive ties to criticism, blame, and resentment. For the view that moral concepts consist only of their normative roles with no substantive conception of what falls under them, a minimalist view, of those concepts and call the view according to which they have a substantive views about which acts fall in their extensions, a substantive view. Again, he writes, if this argument is correct, moral concepts at their core are mere devices for a certain distinctive kind of praise or blame and not, do not incorporate substantive views about what, if anything, falls under their extensions. Now, it seems to me and to Maria that this is not enough to characterize moral concepts, for it cannot distinguish between moral norms and norms of etiquette or aesthetics, say. After all, at least at many latitudes, we equally criticize, even blame, and sometimes do resent people for making noise while sipping broth. Or at least in Italy, if you happen to be in Italy, be careful about that. We have the same reactive attitudes towards adult males, that is men, <laughs> wearing short socks. So, you know, we, we do feel quite strongly as a, as a people against, against wearing short socks. But this, I would say, is a norm of etiquette, if anything. So we need something more to distinguish norms of etiquette aesthetic norms and moral norms. So the distinctness of the reactive attitude is smooth. Praise, blame, criticism, and resentment as such do not seem enough to me, at least, to characterize reactive attitudes that are distinctively moral. More should be said about those attitudes if they are ever, be to, uh, ever, they are ever to be enough to mark the contrast between right and wrong in the moral sense, as opposed to any other evaluative sense. Alternatively, Paul may be taken to suggest, with Wittgenstein perhaps in the Tractatus, 
that morality and aesthetics are one. Said at bottom that they are identified by the same reactive attitudes and are such that if something is blameworthy for aesthetic reasons, it would also reveal a lacking character and vice versa. This view, for, however, is certainly controversial and more to the point, I think it involves not just identity in reactive attitudes, but mutual entailment between offending the eye, say, and displaying a lacking character. Thus, it doesn't seem to do away with more substantive accounts of where distinctively more and aesthetic reactive attitudes and norms come from. It's just an entailment, a mutual entailment between being uh, morally wrong and being aesthetically wrong and vice versa, or the same for being morally right and aesthetically right. So that's the response to um, part at least of false comments. We don't think that his minimalist account uh, is enough to capture what is distinctively moral about these norms. Now, move, moving on to uh, Eduardo, um, our, my comments will actually um, also partly related to things that Max and John have been saying. Uh, since there's there's some overlap in their comments. Um, so hopefully that will allow me to spend a reasonable amount of time on each view without repeating the same things uh, all over again. Now, Eduardo follows McFarlane and Push in thinking that equal validity is not a necessary feature of relativism. A few remarks before, before turning to his arguments are in order. First, and I think contrary to what John says in his comments, not many theorists are persuaded that equal validity should not be part of our understanding of relativism. To the best of my knowledge, only McFadden and Push, and now perhaps some of their followers, since they, their work is so influential, have taken this view. But just a little bit before um, John and uh, Martin started, saying that equal validity was not part or shouldn't be taken to be part of the core idea of relativism, many other people, um, I mean, living philosophers, as we might call them, had a different view. Paul is one of them, Marx to some extent, seems to hold equal validity and Christian right, just to, to mention a few prominent philosophers who have thought long and hard about the issue even though from very different perspectives, the three of them have argued in favor of equal validity as part of relativism. Second, the features of relativism we draw out in chapter one are based on our analysis of the work of many authors and approaches we cover throughout the book. They capture key features of a sizable majority of how a sizable majority of those writing on relativism characterize the very notion of, of relativism. Moreover, in our view, it remains the best way to make sense of relativism. Of course, there are issues about how to formulate equal validity, and I think John is right to say that, at least initially, um, it has to be formulated in quite broad way. And that's what we, I think, do in chapter one, but I'll come back to this point. So these six features that we list in chapter one are not a figment of our imagination or part of our preconceived notion of relativism, nor are they selected to make sure that they cohere with one another. That's a move that only someone who is deeply vested in defending relativism uh, would wanna make from the start. Indeed, as is apparent from the last chapter in the book, chapter 10, we don't think that as things stand, a coherent formulation of these six features together has been provided. Of course, we may be wrong about the six features, then we should be shown to be factually wrong in our understanding of a significant number of views in the history of Western philosophy. And that may be a very interesting exercise that probably we won't take up tonight, <laughs> but we'll move the conversation at that level. Or if, again, we should be 
shown wrong in thinking that these are not necessary and somewhat jointly sufficient condition to characterize views that are ever standing to be called relativist. Personally, I think that before ditching equal validity, it would be worth trying to see if we can provide a model that accommodates all these six features together. Doing that would also move the debate at the metaphilosophical level and would at least make for a new avenue for research. Now, as I said, it is understandable that people vested in defending relativism may opt for ditching one problematic feature like equal validity, but we are not vested in the book in defending relativism. Our book and general outlook is aimed at understanding this notion and at analyzing prominent instances of it as dispassionately as possible. That is to the extent possible by neither presupposing the truth of relativism nor of any opposite view. Um, now, according to coming to some more specific comments on what Eduardo says, uh, according to him, relativism does not require saying that all points of view are on par, but only that everyone is right, quote, from their own point of view. Furthermore, he holds that thinking otherwise would run contrary to non-neutrality our sixth condition, that is the view that each judgment is made from a specific perspective or point of view. In response, let us notice first that being right from one's own point of view can sustain relativism only if it is agreed that all diverse and incompatible points of view are on par or equally valid. If there were only one point of view or only one correct point of view, or if there were merely contextual dependence, that, that is to say one set of standards holds in one context, absolutely as it were, while a different set of standards holds in a different context, absolutely again, as it were. It would be difficult to see why a position would count as relativist. So in passing and in response to a comment that John made in his, um, uh, in his uh, presentation, this is also why we consider Harman's position not just a case of contextualism, but of relativism proper. So the idea that distinguishes these points of view is that in, let's say, um, usual contextualism, the contexts are insulated from one another. So we have, let's say, high standards whenever we do philosophy and we have to meet the certain skeptical standards. But when we talk in the ordinary context, we don't have to do that. The idea that we think relativists, even of a more contextually, contextualist kind than John himself had, is on the other hand that in the same context, for instance, in the philosophical context, different standards would be applicable. Now, concerning non-neutrality, which is an issue that, uh, I mean, a feature that uh, Eduardo uses to uh, actually um, oppose uh, our idea that um, equal validity should be part of the characterization of relativism, let me remind you that the idea is that any verdict in the relevant areas of discourse is always committed to a standard, to a perspective, that it be a moral or epistemic system or framework. For instance, when we pass judgment on sushi being tasty, as well as on the standards that license such a judgment, we don't do that from nowhere, but always from a specific perspective. Yet, if we are relativists, we should also thereby, as relativists, recognize that since there is no neutral standpoint from which a standard or perspective can be deemed correct or incorrect, they're all on par, at least in principle. In principle is important here. Hence, as we state in the book, equal validity actually follows from non-neutrality together with the other conditions. In short, it is inherent in relativism a form of even-handedness each judgment is issued from a perspective and there are multiple and incompatible ones which are all on par, at least in principle. Of course, each of us will occupy one such perspective and will go from there, but it is part of the relativist credo that if reflective, or at least if one is a relativist theorist looking at what people do and say, one will have to acknowledge the parity of other perspectives, even though incompatible with one's own. This to my mind, and I think Maria 
degrees is the beauty of relativism. It teaches us that no matter how committed or vested we are in the relevant areas of discourse, we are not thereby right or wrong absolutely, or necessarily more right than those who think otherwise. It teaches us a form of modesty, I take it, as well as of dispassionate outlook onto the origins of some of our deep-seated attitudes. A thing that I think is important against realists. I'm not a realist, and Maria is not a realist, do you? Of course, it remains a contested issue which areas of discourse are amenable to a relativist treatment. I think it's easier to go with this view when we are dealing with taste and etiquette and much more difficult, if not pernicious, when we are dealing with morality and empirical knowledge, but that is a different story. Furthermore, uh, Eduardo claims that we can have faultless disagreement without equal validity. For faultlessness, he says, does not require holding that other views are right, correct, or true, but only not at fault with respect to the context from which they are issued. Now, Ma uh, Max in his comments at some point mentions the fact that they are flawless. And some other philosophers like Christian Wright may call them blameless or even as it was common in the old days, warrantedly assertable. If put this way, it becomes easy to see that falseness here need not imply truth, but may well depend on a weaker and somewhat epistemically constrained notion. Thus, faultless disagreement would not be a case where people holding opposite views are both right. That is, they would both judge or assert truly opposite or incompatible contents. They would just be both blameless. Each of them is operating correctly given the information on state or attitude that they happen to have. Yet what would prevent the feasibility in that case and therefore arriving at the view that at least one of them is after all not judging truly? In which case at most one party would be right or correct even though we may not presently know which one is right or wrong while knowing that neither is at fault in this attenuated epistemically constrained sense. But I think that no relativistic view would follow from such an understanding of faultless disagreement. It would just allow that given our present state of information, we may yet not know which of these opposite views is correct. So to preserve a stronger notion of faultless disagreement and therefore something more readily recognizable as relativism, I think something like John's machinery needs to be in place with the distinction, but also Mark's machinery between context of use and context of assessment. For that machinery doesn't make play with notions weaker than truth. But as we know, when the context of assessment kicks in, then contents turn out to be true or false, absolutely. That is, judge from A's point of view, for whom sushi is tasty, B is judging falsely that sushi is tasty, say in which case the promised even handiness is once more lost, or so it seems to us. So now moving on to John's comments. John is vested in defending relativism, if anyone is, and ditches um, equal validity. He then interestingly suggests that relativism should be characterized as a family resemblance concept. I and Maria applaud such a suggestion, at least because it moves the debate onto the very interesting issue of how to characterize relativism. Yet, for family resemblance to work, we need to have some clear cases of relativism already in place so that we can add new ones as long as they have something in common, albeit not necessarily the same feature or, or features, with cases already included under the concept. So, I take it that the suggestion that if, we, if I'm allowed to elaborate a little bit on uh, John's suggestion that we should look at this concept as a family resemblance one, then the suggestion would be that some, at least some core relativistic views will uphold uh, uh, equal validity, while some other views like his want and still, and will still count as a relativist because equal validity would not be a necessary condition for relativism. And then he moves on to saying how he would characterize his own preferred notion of relativism. And he says that he prefers a narrow notion of relativism than ours, which has two central features. First, part parties generally disagree, and yet are both correct. 
Now, notice that this comes very close, this characterization that John himself gives. Uh, this comes very close to our conditions four, which is strong incompatibility in our lingo, in our terminology, that is genuine disagreement, and indeed five, that is equal validity. They are both correct. He then adds, at least de facto, conditions one, two, and three, namely non absolutism, dependence, and multiplicity, multiplicity while introducing Max's position. And then he specifies that dependence on a standard, which is a way of fulfilling condition two, namely dependence, should be further specified for we may assess an utterance based on the standards operative at the context of use or of assessment, which may obviously diverge in his uh, proposal. Thus, I for one am left wondering where exactly we disagree. Maybe we disagree over non-neutrality, which is our condition six, Oh, that, I actually doubt it. After all, it seems part of John's view that different taste standards, for instance, are admissible and operative at different contexts of assessment with no, and use, with no possibility of determining from a neutral perspective which one is correct. Or perhaps we actually disagree about how to read five, which is equal validity, as we call it. Maybe that's what he has in mind. What different um, while different standards are on par and based on them, parties are within their rights in returning opposite verdicts over whether sushi is tasty, say, there is no context in which it would be correct, it is true, to judge both that sushi is tasty and that it isn't. Now, maybe John is opposing this idea that there should be a context in which it would be both true to say that sushi is tasty and that it isn't. But this is not how we present equal validity. We simply say that it is both right to affirm that sushi is tasty and to deny it where this is entirely compatible with and indeed demands in a sense that the correctness of both these claims depends on the fact that they are made with different gustatory standards in place. Then gloss correct as true and you will have, I think, McFarland's position. What we do add is that it is part of the relativist freedom to insist that such parity should be appreciated by both committed and neutral parties alike, or at least it should be <laughs> uh, appreciated by relativists if they reflected on the matter. Thus, suppose you love sushi, you will be committed to sushi's tasty, but you should also acknowledge that given different gastric standards, sushi may well not be tasty. Is this the bone of contention? I have a feeling that it may not, in which case I'm still left wondering what, where exactly we disagree. Moreover, notice that in some sense, we too are considering relativism a family resemblance concept. So I think that um, maybe uh, John reads, and maybe others too read our six conditions uh, offered at the beginning of the book in a very strong way. Uh, it's true, as I said before, and as John said in his comments, that we actually present them in a very gen generic, one might say, way, because we want them to be able to uh, sort of specify some of the parameters uh, uh, a little bit more when we go into each specific view. But at least we, we think that presenting the way we actually present them, in fact, all relativist positions apart from, no, sorry, all relativist positions we consider somewhat fulfill these six uh, features. So, um, so actually, while we specify this, this, these six conditions um, that help us identify instances of relativism, we leave it open that there may be global or local versions of relativism. We take Protagoras, presumably to have endorsed a global version of it, whereas John, Max, and others don't go for a global uh, relativist position. And there are stronger and weaker versions of relativism depending on how we read the income or they read the incompatibility condition. So there may be a relativism of distance, um, a la Williams, or multi-mandalism, a la Rovain, whereas uh, uh, 
John and Max's version of, um, of relativism have strong disagreement, which will fall uh, strong incompatibility in place. Now, turning to some more detailed points, John says that his account of disagreement in terms of preclusion of joint accuracy trivially respects what we call the boundless condition, namely the condition according to which um, the acceptance of incompatible contents should concern the same circumstances because, I quote, taste assertions do not concern any specific taste, end of quote. True, according to John, there are multiple and incompatible taste standards, but any truth verdict is issued from a specific standard, that is, the standard of taste, whichever it is, must be fixed to say that a given taste assertion is true and that the opposite one is not given that standard, so that not both can be, be, can be accurately held, therefore there is disagreement. So opposite taste assertions not only do not all concern the same circumstances in the trivial sense, contrary to what John says, but actually must struggle standards and be incorporated within one's own standards, as it were, to turn out not to be jointly accurate, thus giving rise to disagreement. Connectedly, John also claims that we are not keeping in mind the distinction between disagreement in the activity sense uh, and in the state sense, when we claim that this view does not make the right predictions about certain disputes, particularly uh, about taste. For if we claim that once opposite taste verdicts come to light, a relativist should predict that parties could go on disputing, but their dispute, if they engaged in it, would not be rationally sustainable, at least after a point, since their opposite verdicts are issued from different and irreconcilable standards of taste. And you know, if the conversation goes on long enough, the fact that these standards of taste are irreconcilable is what comes to light. And at that point, the dispute would not be rationally sustainable. Of course, we can engage in dispute because we feel like it, because we have time to waste, or uh, because we feel bore, bored and want to engage in conversations with others. But there, there would no point in trying at that stage to convince the other one that they are wrong and we are right. To put it in terms of the boundless condition, those opposite contents are held at different circumstances, that is, relative to different taste standards. It is only by insisting on preclusion of joint accuracy, which, as we just saw, relies on the problematic move of straddling standards, that John can say that there is still a disagreement in the state sense. By our lights in contest, since that move is suspect, particularly from a relativist point of view, since the verdicts are actually issued at different circumstances, it is not at all clear that there is still a disagreement in the state sense. So the claim we are making is that uh, it's difficult to recover that idea. Uh, and that's also why the dispute could not be rationally sustained after a point. Now, moving on to Marx, last but not least, Marx too is critical of the balance condition. His view, however, is that the resulting account of disagreement that we utilize to criticize his position turns out to be a technical notion because we um, insert this uh, aboundness condition. However, we don't think it is a technical notion, but rather quite intuitive and commonsensical. Consider the following case, which to the best of my, my knowledge has been, hasn't been considered in these disputes uh, on on relativism. What may look like an easy side of a mountain to climb, given your excellent climbing abilities, may look like a very difficult climb for a novice like me. Now we have the same mountain, the same side of the mountain. We are considering it in the same possible word, the actual word. But what is different in these two cases, I mean, from my perspective and someone else's perspective, are the different climbing abilities, which may, and this may give rise to the following exchange. A says, that side of the mountain isn't easy to climb, and B says, no, that side of the mountain is easy to climb. Do the parties thereby disagree? Of course, one affirms what the other denies. In that sense, there is an appearance of disagreement, 
Yet their verdicts are received from different perspectives, that is, climbing abilities, and there is an obvious sense in which A and B do not disagree with one another. Indeed, once engaged in a conversation, they may easily rephrase their apparent disagreement as follows. A may say, of course, given your expertise, that side of the mountain is easy to climb. Alas, I'm not as good as you. And B could respond, I understand you are right if you don't think you can do it and that it would be difficult to climb it, it's better for you not to try. Max, I think, is aware, at least implicitly, that his intuitive notion of disagreement embedded in the simple view as he calls it is not that intuitive after all. For he then goes on repeatedly to phrase the alleged disagreement between Clara and Mimi regarding Jaffa Cakes in terms of seeming. I quote, he writes, Clara seems to believe something and Mimi seems to reject what Clara believes. There seems to be a P such that Clara believes that P and Mimi believes that not P. Nevertheless, none of them is committing any mistake. Their beliefs are correct. The simple theory can accept that things are as they seem, end of quote. But we argue the simple theory is too simple. It considers the assertion of opposite contents sufficient for disagreement. The example of the expert and the novice concerning climbing teaches us that the circumstances, and not just the Kaplanian context, as we might call it, and the word, are relevant to whether we are facing a disagreement after all. Thanks. <laughs>